I never read a speech, folks. I got over that a long time ago. We lost our preacher in our church, <clears throat> and the pulpit committee got busy looking for a new guy. They found one. Everybody liked him. He was a handsome dog, but the percentage of the congregation that was female was going up every Sunday. But he had one very bad habit. He used to read all of his sermons out of a loose leaf notebook, get his nose down his notes, you couldn't see him. So they appointed a committee to do some creative thinking about how they could get this guy to overcome his problem. They got an idea. One Sunday after he placed his notebook up in the pulpit, they got him out in a study on some supposed problem of the church. And while they had him out there, one of the members of the committee slipped up into the pulpit, opened up the notebook, reached in, jerked out one of the sheets and wadded it up and stuck it in his pocket. Well, it happened that day he was preaching on the subject of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He was going along with his nose down in his notes. He got down to the bottom of the page and he said, and Adam said to Eve, and he turned the page and he said, my God, there's a leaf missing. <laughs> so, as Bela told you, I spent 15 years on the field in the National Football League as an official and met a lot of people, did a lot of things. My first year, I was working a game in Cleveland. Jim Brown was a fullback for Cleveland. Good football player, 6'2", ran 100 and about 9'5", tough to bring down. Cleveland's playing Dallas. Brown came through the line with a ball, and the big linebacker for Dallas, big ball guy. Incidentally, I see a lot of fellows here in varying stages of baldness. Matter of fact, there's a great reflection from Derek Oxnecker over here. <laughs> don't feel bad, Derek. They don't put marble tops on cheap furniture, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Brown came through the line with a ball, and that big middle linebacker went to tackle him. When he did, he grabbed his face mask. That isn't fair, and that's why we're out there, and I threw the rag and <clears throat> stopped the clock, told a referee I got number 55 on the defense, pulled on a face mask, personal foul, 15 yards. About that time, this guy jumped up, all six foot six, 260 pounds of him. He looked down at me, he said, what? I said, get back in there and play football before I bite your head off. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all real good guys, very politely said, if you do, sir, you'll have more brains in your stomach than you have in your head. So, <clears throat> Uh, people ask me, what was your last game in the National Football League? <clears throat> My last game in the National Football League was a championship game between Pittsburgh and Houston. The winner was going to go to the Super Bowl in Pittsburgh in Three Rivers Stadium in January of 1979. It seems almost impossible now to think that that's, what, 30, 32 years ago? Yep. It was a horrible day, ice freezing from the goalposts, but four weeks prior to that, Four weeks before that, I had been in Pittsburgh for a late afternoon nationally televised game between Pittsburgh and the Dallas Cowboys. The score was 21-17 uh, Pittsburgh in the third quarter when Roger Staubach, quarterback in Dallas, got hit in the head and went down. Now a timeout for an injured player prior to the last two minutes of the half is not count against the three that they guard so carefully. It's a referee's timeout. But unbeknownst to us, the scoreboard operator in Pittsburgh a guy I'll never meet, a guy who probably thinks his job doesn't mean anything, put one time out on the board for Dallas when they're really done. Now, we don't look at the scoreboard. We can't see the scoreboard. <laughs> that, that's part of the criteria for working in this league. If you see the scoreboard, you don't qualify. Now, we got, we got one time up, out up on that scoreboard when they're really done. Staubach goes out. He comes back in. Pretty soon he gets hit again. Down he goes. We signal timeout. Charges to us. Still no charge timeouts for Dallas, but this guy puts two up in the scoreboard. Now with a minute and 50 seconds left in the football game, Dallas ball, Pittsburgh 25, still trailing by four. Staubach called his first timeout, Dallas. We mark one on the game card, and this guy puts three on the scoreboard. <laughs> Developing problem in communications. Things are not what they are in this world. They are what? what people think they are. And 55,000 people and all the players in that place thought there were three timeouts against Dallas. Now with a minute and 20 to go in a ball game, Dallas ball, Pittsburgh 20, Staubach called his second timeout. Dallas, wing marker down, and this guy puts four up in the score. And immediately, immediately, Chuck Mola, coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, began to holler at me, something like, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> And I could not figure out what this great coach was so upset about. I didn't even turn around. Now with 20 seconds left in the ball game, Dallas ball, Pittsburgh 18, fourth down. Staubach called his third and last time out, Dallas. And this sucker puts five up on that scoreboard. And Chuck Noll hollered out, turn around and talk to me, you dirty Framus Hamas Pepalumer. <clears throat> I turned around, 
and he's standing in that six foot wide white stripe area he's not supposed to be and I said what do you want to talk about coach he said I want to talk about how many timeouts you're giving to Dallas <laughs> I said we're giving him three coach and you get back out of the white he said you've already given him five and he took two great big steps across the white out onto the field right in front of my nose on national television I said no coach we've given him three but I'm going to give you 15 yards and I threw the flag in the air oh was that popular in Pittsburgh <laughs> <laughs> they were going to name me Steel Queen. Now, <laughs> now, Bob Frederick, our referee, had been over to tell Landry that he's just used his last time out. He turned around just in time to see my rag hit the ground. <laughs> Bob and I came back across the field, walked off me and said, Artie, what have you done? I said, I have just stuck the Pittsburgh coach half, half the distance to the goal. Put that ball on the nine and give Dallas a first down. He said, yes, and I have to walk it off. I said, that's the penalty of leadership, walk. And then the greatest thing that happened to me in a 15-year career in professional football happened on the next play. Staubach went back to pass, hit Drew Pearson, he ends on right in the numbers, and he dropped it. If he hadn't dropped that ball, I wouldn't be here today. <clears throat> I'd be pushing up marble in some cemetery. But as you consider taking tetanus out of the third world, feeding kids, helping youngsters that are homeless get an education, what does all this have to do, have to do with what you're doing? Well, I'll start telling you. Because you see, four weeks later, just four weeks later, the National Football League, after I made that call, the National Football League sent me back to Pittsburgh to work that, work that championship game with Houston. Nobody. Nobody decides who's going to work where in this league except that league office at 280 Park Avenue in New York. And the officials are rated every week four times. They're rated by a guy in a press box. That's what I did for many, many years. Rated off the films in New York and rated by both coaches. At the end of the year, they add up those ratings. And you, if you are rated number one in your position, you work the Super Bowl and wear one of these rings that I proudly wear. If you're rated second or third, you work the championship game and so on down the line because, you see, we in the National Football League don't pay off on averages. We play, pay off on excellence. So back I went to Pittsburgh to work that championship game with Houston. I'd worked the Super Bowl the year before, and I guess I was rated second or third that last season. And I hadn't been there since I'd stuck Mr. Noel, the only unsportsmanlike conduct foul he had ever had as a head coach. Another true story. I walk into his office two hours before the game in a business suit like this to get permission to use the training room. I was going to have my hip replaced and I had to get taped up. I walked up, haven't seen him now since I stuck him in that Dallas game four weeks ago. He got up from behind his desk, walked around, smiled, stuck his hand out, said, Art, congratulations. I said, thanks. <clears throat> he said, what do you want? I said, I got to get my leg taped. He said, come, well, come on, I'll take you over the training room. We walked about a half a block in Three Rivers State and we walked over there, talked about the weather, families. Never once did that great coach ever mention that call. He was able to take it, put it in a box, forget about it. Well, we got to the training room, and a few ladies that like to know what it's like, I'll tell you. They got these flat uh, leather tables with the black leather tops, and, and uh, linemen and linebackers get taped first, backs and ends get taped last. Some big lineman is laying here getting taped, and two or three other giants are standing around their underwear waiting. It was a terrible day. <laughs> and, uh, Noel said to the trainer, he said, get this guy down. He said, Art's got some pregame duties to do. He got down, I got up. They start to tape my leg and Noel started to leave. And I said, coach, wait a minute. <clears throat> I said, you're the head coach of a championship team and a championship game. And you take the time, the attention to detail to see that I get my leg taped. And I just want you to know that I appreciate it. He said, Art, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> He said, when you're the head man, you've got to be a detail man. You've got to be an organizer. You've got to be a communicator. And then he said, Art, you've got to be a delegator. He said, by the way, Mean Joe Green wants to talk with you about that call you made in the Dallas game. <laughs> <laughs> well, he walked out, and when he did, standing right beside me, was Big Jack Lambert, the big red-bearded linebacker from the Steelers. He's in the Hall of Fame now. I don't know Lambert off the field. He may be a great guy, but I'm going to tell you one thing. When Jack Lambert put on a football suit to go to work, he had no friends. And I'd had a lot of fouls against Jack Lambert. He did not like me. So the minute Noel left the room, I'm laying here on the, this thing getting taped, he looked down to me, he said, you again. I said, that's right, Lambert. He said, every damn time we get a good football game, we get you and your yellow flag against the Steelers. I said, Lambert, I'll see you on the field in two hours. Get out of here. 
you got to take command. Foolish as it was. <laughs> well, he turned around. He walked about two steps. He turned around again with a big grin on his face. And he said, I'll say one thing, Art. He said, you're the second best football official of the National Football League. Man, I felt good. I said, who's first? He said, the other 98 are tied. So, <laughs> Funny thing about football, it's a lot like Kiwanis. They ask you a few questions. Number one, up to the talent change. Football's a game of change. Life is a game of change. The only thing we can be sure of other than death and taxes is death and taxes. The only two things we can be sure of, nothing else. And a football player, a quarterback, gets the play from the line of scrimmage, comes up the line of scrimmage, sees the defense set against that play. Does he buck his head against a stone wall? Of course not. He uses individual God-given power of choice and calls an audible, an automatic. He changes things at the line of scrimmage within the, within the game plan or the corporate strategy or the club plans. Change things on his own, through his own knowledge and enthusiasm. He reaches down, tickles the center. That's what they do. That's why they all want to be centers. It feels so good. <laughs> Our toughest job out there is convincing the center and the quarterback that it's not a lasting relationship. That's the toughest <laughs> He reaches down, tickles the center, and says, 48 blue, flag step. I don't know what that means, but 10 other offensive fo football players, when they're flag step, say it's no longer a 49, it's a square out pass. And that split ends here, and we're here, says, I don't block the linebacker. I'm going to get on four steps, turn to the left. Quarterback throws him the ball, he goes for a first down touchdown. Why? Because he had the ability to change. We had a game in San Diego. John Madden was the coach of the Raiders. Remember, John? Yep. Looked like an unmade waterbed. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm the line judge. I play in the line of scrimmage opposite the headlines. We rerun that line of scrimmage at football. You and Kiwanis come from all kinds of backgrounds, professional lawyers, doctors, business people, educators, all backgrounds, joined together in one common effort. Same thing in football. And the line of scrimmage belongs to the headlinesman and the line judge. Tony Viteri was a headlinesman over on the Oakland side, I'm over on the San Diego side. Now question football fans, how many men do you have to have on a line of scrimmage in a football game? Answer seven. If you have six, it's a foul. You say, why is that important? Well, if you caught a team like Dallas under Landry, Dallas uses a lot of sets. They take the slot man over here on the right, drop him back, bring up the wide receiver. Or we take the tight end over the left, drop him back, bring up the flanker. Sometimes somebody forgets a signal, six guys on the line, throw the flag. I had that foul against Dallas twice in that last Super Bowl. But the question further arises, can you have eight men on the line? Answer, yes. Nine, sure. Ten, absolutely, by rule, you only have to have one man in the backfield. But what do you see? Play after play, game after game, you see seven men on the line of scrimmage. And human beings are creatures of habit. You, me, all of us like to do it the same today as we did it yesterday, so we can we do it the same tomorrow because the rut gets comfortable. But I'm here to tell you that the only difference between a rut and a grave is its length and its depth and how long you are in it. <laughs> and Tony and I had worked over 200 football games and never seen an eight-man line when absolutely true story, second quarter, nothing to nothing, opens ball, third and eight on their own 40, out of the huddle they come up the line and I count eight guys. 88's on the end, 84's inside. Not trusting myself when I get over five and not having my PC with me, I counted them again. I still got eight. Now they set for a second, which the offense has to do on every play. After they set for a second, 88 on here in the end of the line turned and went in motion diagonally into his own backfield, and my wheels are turning. <clears throat> I know that one man for the offense may be in motion parallel to or away from his line of scrimmage, but can he come from the line of scrimmage? I don't think so. That's not good enough. Oakland snapped the ball, I threw the flag. Not too high. <laughs> <laughs> kind of excuse me, please. Com Staber completed a pass for about 25 yards in the first down. Meanwhile, our back judge Ben Tompkins huddled out, great call art, so I come running and no, bring her back, legal motion. But Terry coming over from, from the other side, what is it, what is it? I said, I said he, he was from the end of the line. He said, Art, he's going backwards. I said, he came from the end of the line. He says, so? Now this is not a signal in football. 
<laughs> You're also not a good tool in your life. How, how are we going to educate more kids? Beat the hell out of me. Now. He said, so? I said, so it's illegal. Go tell him. I don't want to talk to Madden. I'm smart than that. I'm over on the San Diego side. And you know what? They think it's a great call. We bring the ball back. Oakland has to putt. Five minutes later, Oakland's got the ball again. Now they got third and 13 back in their own 30. Out of the huddle they come. Eight man line again. 88's on the end again. Set a second. Now, 88 out here knows he fouled last time, but only because he heard his number over the PA system. So he didn't have a clue of what, what, what the rule was or what he did. So he, this time, he's going to take no chances. He didn't do a thing but turn around and go in motion straight backwards. He's going out of the ballpark, baby. They snapped the ball. I threw the flag a mile in the air. I ham this up, but it's all true. Listen to this. Kenny Stabler completed a 50-yard bomb to Cliff Branch down on the other end. And I came running in. No, bring her back. Illegal motion. <laughs> but Terry came running over there. He says, Art, what the devil are you doing? I said, Tony, it is illegal for that guy to go in motion from the end of that line without stopping. He said, well, you go tell him. Now Madden's over, Madden's over there. <laughs> He's selling Ace Hardware. <laughs> I came over, I walked up, him, up to him. He said, Art, what in the world are you doing? So I said, John, it is illegal for that guy to go in motion for the end of that line. And this, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely true story, word for word, is what John Madden, the head coach of the they were world champion, world champion Raiders, said to me on that sunny Sunday. He said, Art, this is our secret play. <laughs> he said, it's the only thing we practiced all week. I said, <laughs> I said, you run that thing 10 times a day, I'm going to throw 10 flags. We went in at the half. What was the first thing I did before I went to the John? Tell me. Rule book. Rule book. Right, you can't carry that thing on the field. It's bulky and it looks strange. When you say, just a second, I'll look that up. <laughs> Here's what it says, football fans. After all 11 players for the offense have come to a full one second stop, one offensive player may be in motion parallel to or away from his line of scrimmage, comma, and he must be a backfield player. Backfield player defined as one who is set for one sec at least one second, at least one yard off the ball. Great call. <laughs> Naturally. But somewhere, sometime, in some meeting, somebody had said to me, if guy is in motion, from, any guy in motion has to stop for at least one second to be legal coming off that line. How do you react to change? When Kiwanis was founded in Detroit in 1915, do you think that they could have imagined what you're doing today? <coughs> Not a chance. I know a guy that died with a cough like that. <laughs> of course, he was in another guy's closet. <laughs> now, sitting over here, sitting over here in the yellow sweater is Don Lund, one of the greatest athletes that ever came, if not the greatest, that ever came to University of Michigan. <laughs> Basketball, football, baseball, captains of the team, played with the Detroit Tigers, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the St. Louis Browns, coached the Tigers, ran their foreign was a coach here at the University of Michigan when we went undefeated and were national champions in baseball. <laughs> the thing he is best known for, this great, great athlete. You see, I'm talking to you about change, how you react to the unexpected, because in this society and this world we live in, changes and problems have a nasty habit. They don't announce themselves. The people, the thugs that threw into the, flew into those buildings in New York and the Pentagon and it later crashed in Pennsylvania did not say, here we are, we're coming. Our country had to respond to that without any advanced knowledge. You and Kiwanis are doing things that were never dreamed of in 1915, you see. Well, let's take Mr. Lund for a minute. 
Uh, he was a home run hitter. He's up to bat. He's up to bat, and he hits one right on the screws. It's going out, baby, and he starts his trot for first base and looks up and sees a bird out in left field falling to the ground and feathers flying and the ball going into the stands. <laughs> Babe Ruth, 714 home runs. Hank Aaron, 754 home runs. Never hit a bird. <laughs> Mark McGuire, 70 home runs in a season. Never hit a bird. <laughs> Bonds, I don't know how many home runs after he beefed himself up. Never hit a bird. <laughs> the only man in professional baseball that ever hit a bird and got two fouls on one pitch. <laughs> So, people say to me, people say to me, well, how do you officials, how do you know, you've got all these rules, you don't know whether it's going to be a run or a pass. In all truth, we have to be reaction people, defensive people. The people who know what's going to happen are the offensive people, and the rules are written that way. Uh, to, but offensive pass interference, for instance, begins, begins with a snap. Defensive pass interference only starts when the ball's thrown because the defense never knows it's a pass until it's thrown. The offense knows from the start. So we, we, have, uh, we are reaction people. Defensive people are reaction people. They have to react and also act after they react. Leroy and Bubba, I don't know how I get into this stuff, two Texas rednecks are talking. Leroy said to Bubba, he said, Bubba, what are you going to do this year in your vacation? Well, he said, I don't know, Leroy, but I'm damn sure going to do something different. He said, what do you mean different? Well, he said, three years ago, I went to Tahiti and Erlene got pregnant. He said, two years ago, I went to Hawaii and Erlene got pregnant again. He said, last year, one of them there Caribbean cruises, dang, if Erlene did get pregnant again. He said, well, what are you going to do different? He said, by golly, this year, I'm taking Erlene with me. Now, <laughs> Did you explain it to him? Good. <laughs> so, yes, not only how you react to change, but being a cause of change. And don't you see your tetanus program internationally, your program of, of educating these homeless kids, your food gathering for, for people who don't have enough to eat, all of that. All of that is being action people in the face of change. Number two, do you know where discipline fits into a successful operation? I'm a symbol of discipline on a football field. Somebody make the rules, somebody else has to enforce them. That's just the way it is. People ask me, do you, do you agree with all the rules? Heck no, I never, I never did. I had rules I wanted to get changed and did get one changed. But as long as I'm out there and the company or the club or whatever it happens to be says this is the way it is if I disagree I'll disagree in private and say we ought to change this but if I'm out there I'm going to enforce that and I think we have a, a serious discipline gap in our country today I, I, I think that we have this business of being able to keep people from having to go to jail for some heinous crime or some little complication of the law, and I, I think we have to have laws and all that, but I'm, this discipline in the United States of America has suffered over the last 50 years since I was in school. There was a question about it. We, we I had a guy by, in, our, in our school by the name of Harry Garst. He was a math teacher. And Harry Garst was a fine teacher. He had a big shock of black hair, and he stood outside between classes, and he stood out, outside of his door. And he had a scowl on his face. And Harry Garst was the peacekeeper in our school. Nobody. You couldn't run in the hall, you couldn't slam the locker, you had to dress properly, and that is fine with me. I have seen in my years in athletics, and Don has too and anybody else that's been involved to any degree, what has happened when you have somebody who not only knows his stuff or her stuff, 
but they are a real disciplinarian. I've been asked, who is the coach? If you could have any coach, and you had your pick of all the coaches that you've known, who would you pick? I'd say I'd wake up that Italian from Green Bay, Vincent Thomas Lombardi, and he, I would hand him the keys and say, here you are. Let me tell you something. He was not a real likable guy. The players hated him, but they learned to love him when he was dying in Washington. I met Willie Davis one time in the St. Louis airport. He had been to Washington, D.C. to say goodbye to Lombardi, and he bought me a cup of coffee in a St. Louis airport. True story. And he said, Art, I hated that man. He said, I was nothing but a big, dumb, black football player when I came to Green Bay, and he made a man out of me. He made, and I was there, worked a game in Milwaukee, came out afterwards, and here was, was Willie Davis, six foot, three or four, 280 pounds with his wife and kids, in a suit. Lombardi made them all wear suits and ties wherever they went, on an airplane, to a game, from a game. You left the dressing room suit and tie. Or a $150 fine, which was big in those days. He was at the parking lot. He had an armload of books. I said, what's with the books? He said, oh, you know the old man, Arnie. He said, won't let us stay with the families the night before a game. And he said, he's got me going back to get my master's degree, and I was studying, MBA. Get my MBA. I said, you're getting an MBA? He said, yeah. He said, you know him, he kept hollering and hollering, I just went to shut him up. <laughs> it's a true story. Next, next September, I worked, that was in November of one year. The next September, I worked opening day in Green Bay. I came out the fence, beautiful fall day. He's beside me. I said, Willie, did you get your master's degree? Yep. I said, congratulations. When? He said, last May. Congratulations, I said. And he said, what did Lombardi say? He said, he said the same thing you did, Art. He said, he said it this way. Congratulations, Davis. Now you go for your doctorate, and I want the papers on my desk Tuesday, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> now, let, let's, let's fa fast forward to today. Willie Davis, poor kid, poor kid, third stringer at Cleveland, traded, traded to Green Bay, traded to Green Bay. Lombardi gets a hold of him, recognized his talent, made him first. He's A, in the Hall of Fame in football, B, a Ph.D., C, worth about $400 million. You think discipline doesn't help? Guess again. And there's the discipline of loyalty. Boy, did I learn about that in football. We had a game in Chicago between the Bears and the Green Bay Packers. I called a clip against the Bears that took the winning touchdown away from them. Now, clipping is blocking from the rear. Blocking from the side is not a clip. And there's an iffy one from right in here. I got torn apart on TV, the papers. The next week, we're in New Orleans, sitting in a hotel room on a Saturday night, looking at five rolls of slow motion film, as every crew does every week. And they got a big question mark by this. Check, check this. We don't think it's a clip. We ran the play about four times. Four of the guys. Wouldn't take a stand, but Tony Viteri, my good friend, the head, head linesman who differed with me, occasionally jumped up and he said, Art, you know better than that. was no clip. Now, I was on a short fuse. Tense, I jumped up. I said, Tony, it was a clip. He said, it wasn't a clip, and we ended up toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and they had to pull us apart, and I've seen that several times. But I'll tell you something I have never seen. I have never seen one football official in the National Football League show up another one on the field. If that back judge calls some little bump pass interference and the guy couldn't have caught the ball with a butterfly net, you don't see the field judge come around and say, oh my God, Bela, how could you call that? He's smiling, nodding his head. They're teammates. He's going to protect saying, Bela, dummy. <laughs> Pick up your flag. He couldn't have caught it with a net. You talk about loyalty. After that game, I, I lived in Peoria, Illinois at that time, and halfway between Peoria and Chicago, a little town of Fairbairn, there was a farmer up there who was a wild Chicago bear friend and a good friend of mine. And uh, he had told me, he said, Art, if you ever, you ever <clears throat> want to come deer hunting, we've got a lot of deer, bring your friends and come on up. So after I made that call a month later, he saw me before this game, made that call a month later, I said to the guys at the dressing room, anybody want to go deer hunting, let me know. And Bob Frederick, our referee, said, I'd like to go. He said, I'll fly out Tuesday. So Bob flew out Tuesday, Wednesday morning at 4 o'clock. We're up, got the guns, got, drove to Ferry, got there about quarter to 6. I parked out by the fence, left Bob in the car, and I went up to the door and knocked. Farmer came to the door, and he stuck his hand out, and he said, Art, I want to tell you right now that clip you called was a great call. I don't care what the Chicago Tribune said. I said, well, thanks a lot. 
He said, I'll tell you another thing. You've got the best referee in the National Football League. He's got the sharpest signals, knows the rules. I said, that's Bob Frederick, number 71. He said, that's the guy, 71. I said, he's in the car. He's going deer hunting with me. He said, well, you tell him. I said, he's the best referee in the NFL. I said, I'll do it. He said, will you do me a favor before you go out? I said, anything you want. He said, you see an old mule out by the barn? There's an old swayback mule out there. Said, that mule's 26 years old. He's a family pet. Got cancer. I can't bear to shoot him. Before you go hunting, would you mind shooting my mule? I said, I don't want to shoot your mule. <laughs> I can't miss that thing. He said, you'd be, you'd be doing me a favor if you shoot. I said, okay, I'll shoot him. He said, thanks a lot. We'll have you a hot breakfast when you get back. He went in the house, and I went back out to the car. On my way out there, my sense of humor got me. I worked myself up to a fake lather, got in the car, slammed the door. Frederick said, what's the matter? I said, that old fool won't let us hunt. He said, won't let us hunt. I flew from dinner. I said, no, I saw that bear game. He said, that clip I called was the worst call he ever saw. And worse than that, he said, that guy that wears the white hat was the worst referee in the National Football League. And when he said that, it was too much for me. I'll do it. I'm going to do I'm going to shoot his damn mule. I, I took my gun a bang. I dropped that thing in one shot. Well, I bit my lip to keep from laughing. Before I could turn my head, I heard his gun go bang, bang. He said, all right, I got two of his cows. Let's get out of here. So you see, we have teamwork to me means a respect for the dignity of difference in people. And it's a game of failure. A guy gets knocked down, get up, knocked down, get up, but if he keeps getting up, maybe he blocks the punt and wins the ball game. Knowing the two L's of failure, to learn and laugh. If all you do is learn, if all you do is learn, you develop a big fat ulcer. If all you do is laugh, they throw a net over you or haul you off to the funny farm. <laughs> But it's to know the two L's of failure because it's not going to work all the time. And to being able to laugh at yourself. I poked some fun here today. Poked fun at bald people, at myself. And guy walks into the store. He says, I want two pounds of Polish sausage. Guy says, are you Polish? He says, wait a minute. If I come in and ask for French bread, would you ask me if I was French? He said, no. If I come in and ask for English muffins, would you ask me if I'm English? No. Why when I come in here and ask for Polish sausage, you ask if I'm Polish? He says, because it's a hardware store. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a truth gap in the United States of America. An inability for people to stand up and take responsibility for their own actions. Tire blows out on the car, sue the tire company. It wasn't because you didn't inflate it or you drove them properly, sue the tire company. Blame it on somebody else. Right. Learning how to take blame. Jim Joyce over here in Detroit, when he took that no hitter away from Galarraga, bad a cause it was, was a real icon, a real positive image, and how everybody reacted at Jim Leland, the manager, Galarraga himself, the pitcher, and Jim Joyce, the umpire, reacted to that. He admitted it, and they were magnanimous. They hated it, of course. They probably could, felt they could have killed him, but they took it because the guy was honest. And I blew, I blew a call, Rick Volk, who was the All-American Safety here at Michigan, and Bob Chappius's nephew, Intercepted a pass and ran 106 yards for it in Baltimore, and I thought he stepped out of bounds, and he hadn't. He'd missed it by a foot. Blew a whistle and took the longest interception return in NFL history away from this kid. My last game of the first season. But when Shula, it's in his book, if you want to read it, everyone's a coach. This whole thing's in his book. How do know? You so-and-so, you rookie so-and-so, what are you doing out there? I turned around and said, I blew it, coach, and I feel terrible. He never even said anything to the press. He never called the league. He never did anything. When they called him, he said, they said, why didn't you say anything? If the press would call us. He said, I was hollering to a guy, I didn't even know his name, I was a rookie. And he said, he said, he turned around and said, I blew it, coach, I feel terrible. He said, he's an honest man, what's left to say? I made more friends with the bad calls I made than I ever made with all the good ones. That's the truth, that's the truth. And I tell young officials this, if you make a mistake, you admit it right on the spot. Okay, now. Guy's coming down the street, one more story. Sees a sign, talking dog for sale. And boy, that's beautiful, I'm going in. Brings the doorbell, guy comes to the door, he says, you the man with the talking dog? He says, yeah, you interested? I sure am. He said, come on in. He said, the dog's name is Ralph. Say hello to him. Guy says, hello, Ralph. The dog says, hi, how are you? He said, this is amazing. He said, Ralph, what's your background? He said, well, he said, I was a Swiss mountain dog. I helped save 325 lives in the Swiss, Swiss Alps. And the United States Defense Department heard about me and sent me a green card. And 
brought me over here and trained me as a marine intelligence dog and I spent four years in Iraq and now I'm retired. I go out and read to the older folks at Glacier Hills and stuff. And, uh, and he said, that's wonderful. He turned to the guy and said, this is amazing. Why would you want to sell a dog like that? The guy says, because he's a damn liar. He's never done any of those things. <laughs> All right, now my last question. Are we men and women of action? Here's where you lay it on the line. I often said in football, you can know that rule book called be in the best physical condition, but the real question comes when you ask yourself, am I willing to throw the flag for pass interference on the one yard line with a score tied, 80,000 people and 113 million watching on television as we had in my last Super Bowl. Willing to stand up and be counted when the going gets tough. Because beyond all the fellowship of Kiwanis, the fun at lunch, the fun at parties, the fun we've had here today, underneath all of that is that fundamental responsibility to make it count for your community, your state, and your nation in spite of all of its faults, the best place to live and earn a living on the face of God's green earth. And you're different. You're different from all walks of life, male, female, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, perhaps Muslim, perhaps atheist. I, atheist, I don't care. So long as you are interested in making Kiwanis hum for the future. Because isn't it strange how prisons of kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools a shapeless mass in a book of rules, and each must make, ere life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. You, with what you're doing, tetanus, education, food, are building stepping stones to a better future for this, your community, this state, this country, and the world. Good luck, God bless you, and good day. Thank you.